All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Leslie Kirby, and I'm the chair of the Jewish Community Relations Committee of the Jewish Federation and Jewish Foundation of Nashville and Middle Tennessee. We're delighted to have with us today for our Lunch and Learn, Marilyn Collett, who's a professor emerita of English at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and past Knoxville Poet Laureate. Her poetry is included in New Voices, an anthology of contemporary voices on anti-Semitism and 101 Jewish poems for the third millennium, including a poem that she wrote about Violins of Hope. We did a lot of programming locally around Violins of Hope. I want to thank Deborah Olashansky, um, our Community Relations Director, for making this cashier connection uh, between Marilyn and myself so that Marilyn could join us today. I wanted to do something in honor of uh, National Poetry Month, and so she suggested you. So we are delighted to have you here um, you. in all of our forms. And can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be here today? Thank you, sure. Um... Well, I uh, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, and we uh, we we went to New we came to New York when I was three years old. Um, my mother was deep south, my father was Brooklyn, um, and uh, so that gave a lot of tension in the house. That was that was a poet being born right there. I mean, you know, sort of mini civil war at the dining room table, um, and uh, went you know went went to Tufts and Rutgers, and then came to uh, New, uh, Knoxville for the job directing the creative writing program. Uh, I was in the department for uh, 20, 27 years and, uh, and re retired recently in 2018. Um, the Knoxville Poet Laureate gig was lovely because I got to meet so many good people. Um, I loved every second of it. And I had to write poems about Knoxville, some of which are just the, you know, they belong in the anthology of bad verse. Um, there's one, a, a book of bad verse called The Stuffed Owl, which if you don't have it, you should get it because you'll just go crazy laughing. Um, and yeah, so I did, I did some poems that were worthy of that book. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you got to do a few of those in order to get to the ones that are decent, right? Of course. So <laughs> How does one become a poet? Um, <laughs> it always intrigued well, me with know, the creative things, right? I had some wonderful teachers in college. I had Maxine Kuhlman and XJ Kennedy, and they com they just completely inspired me. I had Madame Pradell in the French department. We were all in love with her. She was a, a theater person, and so she did poetry that was performance, you know, and that that's a great way to get started too. So we, we couldn't decide if we loved her, if we loved poetry. It was very confusing because she was so good. And so, so, you know, she was exquisite too. Um, so those teachers were, you know, they had a major impact on me. And so do you remember the first poem you ever wrote? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I choose to forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember, I don't remember the poem, but I remember showing it to XJ Kennedy. My maiden name was Zimmerman. He looked at it and said, it's a zombie, Zimzy. <laughs> so, you know, that was the start. He was, it was funny, but I, he was kind. So when did you publish your first poem? I published poems in, in college and then, you know, did more of the publishing in graduate school. Um, graduate school, I was in comparative literature at Rutgers. It was a very male dominated field at the time and that department was, I only had one woman teacher. She was an instructor, all the professors were male. And uh, some of them were, well, I won't go into detail but it was, it was hard to survive that and so I wrote poetry as a kind of like, this is my place, this is what, you know, and it saved me. Gave me a place to be myself, to meet my own voice, to say what I needed to say. It didn't mean I had to show it to people. And so it was, um, I, it was kind of happened because I was having such a difficult time, but the poetry gave me an outlet that was breathing room. Wonderful. Has that yeah. changed? So has the male dominated nature of ah. academic poetry at least changed? Yes, yes, definitely, yeah. 
Um, my good friend Joy Harjo is the Poet Laureate of the United States right now. She um, is an example of what is happening now, you know. Um, yes, it has changed. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's been true in many academic fields, but I think some more so than others, right? Oof, really, yeah, definitely. So would you like to share some of your recent poems with us? And then we'll discuss. Yeah, more. I would love to. Perfect. So um, what I'm going to do, our theme today is Mishpoka. So this can be a lot of family poems. But I'll start out with one silly one that just, you know, you'll see that it has a Jewish uh, temperament in there. Beggar. Just one, I begged the muse. You again. Always the same shtick. If you want the line, you'll have to earn it. How? Write about something besides younger men, Muse said. Think of Elizabeth Bishop who spent 20 years on the moose. No, I won't. Too late. I was already minding my moose au chocolat. I got a smile out of you. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so move into the, some of the family poems. This is called Easy Listening Music, I-75. My father liked easy listening music. Everything else had been hard. Work was his birthright. His mother Anna scrubbed floors, carrying her youngest, Harry. His older brothers had opted out a small time crook, a big shot with Murder Incorporated. No wonder my father was neat, no grime. He was proud of his fingernails, clean little moons over clean hands. So why do I gather clutter? Here she is, my grandma Anna, standing in the narrow aisle of her secondhand store. Anna, saver of old sweaters, mothballs, pogroms hidden under mounds of cloth. She hid her guitar on top of the hall closet. Now we kids would have been embarrassed to hear her sing Yiddish, eager as my mother was to rise to middle-class brightness. What songs did my grandmother take with her from Russia? At 15, did she sing her mother's lullabies in the ship's hold? Croon them again to little Harry, to Nat, and Sammy, and my frightened Aunt Marilyn? Were there other babies who didn't survive hungry nights in Coney Island? Markers for Indian men slip by this ground I ride easily over. The Jewish graves are dispersed. Of Anna, I have no traces, only me. I want to be a song my grandmother would have recognized. Rest a little, Harry. Sleep, my little Anna. Shen vide lavona. Pretty as the moon. It's beautiful. Thank you. I like the line about being a song my grandmother would recognize. Oh, thank you. And this is called Twilight Sleep. It's um, after reading Seamus Haney's book, Electric Light. When Seamus Haney's deeply cargoed sailor spread his wet clothes in the sun, we gasped with delight. When mommy hung heavy sheets on our backyard lines in Oceanside, only the wind clapped. Unlike Anglo-Saxon mommies, mine never swore my friends were heathen brutes. Nebuch, she deemed the men I dated poets. She was right to be scared. Mostly they were Meshuggana. Steve, the Jewish doctor, she liked, three years out of my life. Unlike baby Seamus at my birth, no hearty Dr. Curlin came round. That nice Dr. Monsky from Montgomery delivered. Ma never glimpsed his busy hands. Those days hospitals dispensed with memory. Say what you will about the womb's natural opium and 46 doc shot raving moms with dope. Forgetting is almost as important as remembering, even now. Women and sun-washed sailors don't doubt. My mother had a very strong Southern accent. She was from, she was born in Birmingham and raised in Montgomery. Very strong Southern, and when she taught Hebrew school and the children complained because they couldn't understand the Hebrew with the Southern accent on top of it. <laughs> All right, this one's called Packing Light. I was bragging to my friends that I was packing light and, you know, and then 
and then um, all my luggage got lost and I freaked out. Packing light. When I said I wanted to travel light, I didn't mean I'd part with undies and mascara that all my baggage should go missing. When the airline rang my hotel with sorry, I started making excuses. Um, I won't be able to attend the writer's conference after all. Uh, medical reasons, my heart, etc. When the Buddha realized he'd lost everything, that we were born to die, he stopped desiring. New no, Grandma Anna would have asked, was he Jewish? But the female bodhisattvas wrapped in silk swirled beneath headdresses that rivaled Yerushalayim. Not so the Mishpoka. Grandma in the shtetl, cousins becalmed by the Schwarzwald, were forced to let go. My parents clung hard to their houses, cars, and daughters, which begged the question, Marilyn, what ghosts can you pack up, pitch over the side? What will you take with you into your 60th year? Hanging here like a little spider, lightness feels pretty good, no? Even with the dark gulping around you. So did you miss the whole conference? <laughs> um, I don't, I, I, no. <laughs> no, no, I just missed my luggage. <laughs> oh yes, I was, I was being so yes, packing light, and then wait, where is it? <laughs> so the New York grandma, we had two grandmas. My mother's mother was the Montgomery grandma, a little sweet little Southern lady, and the New York grandma was a sweet little Brooklyn lady. And uh, so in this poem, she gets. I didn't get to know her very well, and so I regret that. I wish I'd had more time with her. Um, it seems like she's coming into poems more and more. Excuse me. The New York grandma disputes Marcus Aurelius. Nothing lasts forever or even for very long, Marcus Aurelius opined. Oi, he didn't know your Uncle Harry, grandma said. His stories were snoozers and he passed gas at the table. Marcus, are you nuts? Didn't know Cossacks. How long we hid, no joke. Marcus the bilious never got packed into steerage for Ellis. But you got here, Grandma. You got here. Look at the bright side. Oi, Grandma said. It was very dark for a very long time. Aurelius was a schlemelius. Ask your Uncle Nat how long steel bars lasted in Sing Sing. Ask the East River how long it took to sink his guns. Ask the ones riddled down. Stop it, Grandma. We need hope. Oi, hope. The cockroaches on Coney Island had hope. Ask my guitar on top of the hall closet how long it waited. Sometimes I play when no one hears. In secret, I strum Yiddish songs, and my heart rejoins the beat. Secrets are long. Secrets are long. Music echoes over Steppy's past pogroms. And love? I'm still holding my baby daughter, my sons, and the mothballs from my secondhand store staving off hungry enemies, keeping your little wool coat safe in case by some miracle there's a great grandbaby and a better moving day. Let's see, does she come into this one again? I think there's another grandma in this one. I can this almost hear my grandmother saying, oi, hope. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the cockroaches had hope. <laughs> this is a prose poem. I don't know, do you ever write prose poems? I don't, but mm -hmm. I, I like reading other people's. Okay. Uh, so I think the grandma's come into this one too. This is called No Egg, No Pony. Easter Sunday afternoon, Nassau County hosted an egg hunt. The winning child would score a pony, a real pony. We were mud poor, could barely afford to feed ourselves and Cindy our mutt. Jewish kids didn't hunt for eggs, we ate them. Passover, we searched for the Afikoman, but that day we were all in. Ami drove me to the amphitheater where the hunt for a pony began. I was six. All I found were dust and fancy dressed kids. Maybe the egg was jammed in a politician's pocket? Someone must have won. I wailed, but what would we have done with a pony? We could only afford rent for part of our house. Rudy, the owner, the drunk, lived in the upstairs guest room until we finally ditched him and the Montgomery grandma moved in. That night, daddy brought home a magic slate. 
from Red Hook Candy Store. I drove mommy, daddy, my baby sis, and three little pigs looking. I drew mommy, daddy, my baby sis, and three little pigs looking for payback. I pressed too hard on the slate, scratched my name in block letters, etched a ghost pony who didn't need pockets or food. When we write about disappointments, hopefully they become a little easier, right? Well, that was like I was six years old. <laughs> All right, well, okay, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a few more. This is called Mezuzah. It's in memory of uh, one of my great aunts, uh, Hedwig Schwartz, who was the only survivor of deportation in, in Rexingen, in Horb Rexingen. She fell off a transport car and some good Samaritan, no name, took her to the hospital in Stuttgart where the uh, nuns took care of her. And so many years later, my sister and I, uh, in 1994, we went over and we went to thank the current generation of sisters there for what they had done. They told me that my relative Hedwig um, was the only Jew in the hospital and that they treated her with silence because they thought silence was good medicine. Can you imagine? That sounds awful. I know. This is called Mezuzah in memory, Hedwig Schwartz. In the doorpost of her house, a hollow where the mezuzah used to hang, I press my hand against the indentation, my way of speaking to the past touch the hollow where the mezuzah used to hang. In Horb, Nazis renamed her street Hitlerstrasse. My way of speaking to the past is to listen, press the old men for answers. 1941, Jews were packed into Hitlerstrasse. Now it's a winding picture postcard road, Jew free, pleasant as it seemed before Nazis pressed my family into Judenhausen. I press my hand against the indentation. Over Horb, a hundred doorposts echo. Hollow. Um, this is the violence of hope. I was asked to create a poem for the performance in Knoxville. And I think what I will do, well, I, it's, it's a long poem, so I think I'll just read the first part of it. Okay. <clears throat> violence of hope, Knoxville, one. I don't blame you for hope, for wanting violins. For the Schwartzes of Horb, there were no elegant sounds, no quivering long notes. Deportation came crashing and swift. But for Hedwig, there was air. The nameless angel who rescued her broken body from the transport car hurried her to Marion Hospital, where the sisters treated the only Jew with silence. The just man who lifted her from the rails offered hope the key to staying human. Each violin reminds us that silence is no remedy for persecution. I, uh, when I went to the Holocaust Museum in DC, initially starting to do my research about uh, my family history, we didn't find the names of any children on the list of those who'd been killed. And so my fantasy was that the children had escaped, which was not true. But uh, this is that one. To my poem of hope, I don't blame you for hope, for wanting the children to have survived. Because their names were not inscribed in the minority registration, you assumed they had slipped through the net. My dear Horb was a hillbilly dot. Everyone knew everyone. Now we find this handwritten ed entry by Hedwig Schwartz in her daily book of prayer. On Friday, November 28, 1941 at 550 AM, our dear good daughter, Hilda Sarah Lemberger and our dear good grandson, Siegfried Israel Lemberger moved away from here. We only wish that God may watch over them and that they stay well. Their grandmother kept Sarah and Israel in case of Nazi eyes. Mother and son, quote, moved away from here in early darkness. The rooster couldn't crow. The files reveal that Hilda and Siegfried, called Friederlich, 
were deported east for labor assignment, that is to say Riga, declared dead 4-1-1942, for tot erklacht, pronounced by anonymous agents with past participles on their hands. Dear poem, if we look again, and we must, we will find scraps, scrawled words, secret histories, the cry between the lines. Remember, they called me Freddy. I was six years old. Here's what really happened. This one is called How to Get Heat Without Fire, and it's, it's a love poem. It was a love poem to a friend of mine whose who's, uh, parents were Auschwitz survivors. So how to get heat without fire is how to love without hurting anyone. How to get heat without fire. Beneath the dark floor, there has always been love, but the trick is how to get down to it. Shall I tear my way down like a tiger clawing the floorboards when this tearing down is what scarred you? Whose mother is there in the dark trying hard to hide you from the memory of the floorboards in flames? How to get heat without fire? To coax light open, to ease you new into the world if I'm not a mother or a beloved. Pull back, peel back dead bark, pull back the boards we trample, throw each other down on and through some days. Turn the floor into a pool we can dive deep into. Cradle the mothers, let the animals swim their ways. Has music ever saved anyone? Then I will re-enter my life as sound, as, as notes strung like pearls that you have yearned to enter. I will be sound, I will be sound and silence listening. Now that poem was turned into a song cycle by New York composer, Tom Sapulo. So if you put in my name on Google and how to get heat without fire, the song cycle will come up. And I was invited to, um, to, uh, to hear the, uh, a performance of that in New York at Cooper Union in the big hall. And the, um, the, the song, the, the soprano was a large woman whose voice filled the room and she sang this and the so sound just went on and on and on. Oh. It was wonderful. Uh -huh. So you can, you, can hear, you can hear that on, uh, if you Google. Great. Yeah, how to get here. That's actually one thing I was gonna ask you about. Yeah. You know, we live in Nashville and yes. we have songwriters all around us. And I have a friend who's a songwriter and she tells me that she thinks that songwriting is just poetry set to music. So I wondered what you thought about that idea. I mean, some song, ly song lyrics are more poetic than others. But. That's true, that's true. Well, it was just a wonderful life-changing experience for me to hear my work sung. Not every poem is gonna be, uh, you know, lend itself to be, being sung. And the amount of work it took to do that, to put it together as music was extraordinary. Um, I'm sure. But, uh, but it really taught me more about what those poems meant when I heard them sung. And every year, some graduate students in music will write to me asking my permission to sing. So it keeps going, it's lovely. Yeah. That's great. Do you have more that you wanna read right now or do you wanna take some questions? Why don't we take some questions and see okay. how that goes? So we had a question put into the chat about your process for deciding what makes a topic poem worthy. So is it, do you sit down and think I'm gonna write a poem about X or do, do you get struck by something and feel compelled to write about it or what's your process? It happens both ways. I mean, sometimes uh, a, a line will just come and then that line will give birth to the rest of the poem. Um, that's, that's wonderful when that happens. And sometimes like when I was poet laureate, I got assigned to write things. And sometimes, you know, so when you, when you practice, you've done your finger exercises every day for 40 years and someone says, okay, so write this, then you just do it. You know, you just do it. And sometimes it works out better than others other times, but uh, hopefully at least they're coherent. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones you've read for us today certainly have been. Oh, you're kind. Thank you. Do you find that as time moves on that you write about different things? So your um, topics that strike you, have they changed over time? 
I've, I've always written love poems and I still write love poems. Um, now that is something more of a challenge in our culture where, you know, if you're 20, it's okay to write love poems. If you're 74, you know, um, I actually had, it was, I think it was at Ball State when I read a, uh, read, read a few love poems. And this was, you know, I was probably 50. A, an elderly man in the back of the room raised his hand and said, how long are you gonna keep doing this? You know, and I said, as long as I have breath, sir. Good for you. <laughs> I think it's beautiful that you still write love poems. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, someone else posted, um, who are your favorite poets and what inspires you? Uh, there's, there's more than one. You know, I have many favorite poets. Um, I had some wonderful teachers. I went out to... Uh, when I turned 50, I gave myself a present of going out to a, a workshop called the Community of Writers in, in Squaw Valley, California. And there I had Lucille Clifton. I went back three times. I had Lucille Clifton, Yusef Kumanyaka, um, Marie Howe, Sharon Olds, Galway Cannell, may he rest in peace. They were all amazing. You know, I just, I fell in love all over again with poetry and, uh, you know, they were strict, too. I mean, Galway was especially, he, he, you, he, everything was supposed to be positive. The tone of it was supposed to be positive. So you would read, a brand, everybody wrote a new poem every day. So when you're doing that, some of it's going to be terrible. So the, the deal is you're positive. And if you want criticism, you make an appointment with the poet, you go see them, and then they tell you what they really think, right? Wow, that was painful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But it, it taught me a lot about, about, not just about writing, but about, about the teaching process. Right. You know, how much kindness can matter. For and sure. then when to start, you know, going like, yeah, but if, you know, you might consider the following change, right? It's always the hardest part about teaching is you want to yeah. give, you know, positive feedback, but sometimes things have to shift and they're not right the first time. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah. Um, someone also asked, where do you write? Um, so do you have a specific physical location or do you just kind of write whenever the mood strikes you? Well, I find uh, pieces of paper with handwriting all over them. I mean, some of them are virtually unreadable, but um, <laughs> but this this computer right here for the time being uh, during, you know, this this is where I sit and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a welcoming place. So, yeah. Of course, I made the transition years ago from writing by hand into to writing on the computer. At first, it didn't feel okay because I liked the physical feeling of the hand on the paper, but gradually got used to it. And then, of course, you got to love the fact that you can make changes so easily. You know, let's revise here and then it just, you know, it's, you save it and then you get, get on with it. And delete it if it's awful. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Just don't delete things too quickly. No, that's true. No. <laughs> Back to the positive feedback. Thing. That's right. <laughs> uh, someone else asked, what do you like the most about writing poetry? Oh, so much. Um, <clears throat> it just it gives me a place to be myself and to be myself in a way that's rhythmical and lyrical and, you know, lets me discover you know, I think that if you're writing a poem and you already know the ending, there's really not too much point in it. But if you let the poem be like a vehicle, uh, a vehicle for discovery and you surprise yourself, somebody asked me, how do you know when a poem is ended? Well, you know, when you have that feeling of like, ah, you know, like you found something out. And if you, if you already know what, what's happening, then that, that poem isn't over yet. I love that. Thank you. Um, someone also asked uh, more about when you got started. So she's asking, was it kind of a person or an experience that compelled you to start writing poetry? I, I actually got started writing in like sixth grade. I wanted to be a mystery writer. When they asked us what we wanted to be, you know, for career day, I gave them three choices. I said, I want to be um, a writer, a teacher, and a policewoman decoy. Well... Uh why well, the, <laughs> I think that was hormones, right? So um, luckily the writing and the teaching did take place and I didn't really need to do the other. 
there was enough excitement in the writing. No, it might have been a, an interesting experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. So, uh, but but I, I started writing in sixth grade and it was stories. I wrote stories and I wrote stories about how much prettier I was than my sister. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, and then um and then high school we had some had some poetry going on, but it was pretty painful. It was a lot of the rhymed, you know, a moose right. and a goose together had juice. Right. But um and then in college I had those wonderful teachers and that turned me around, you know, that was like uh, life changing. So a combination of person and, and experiences. Yes, yes. So she also asks, and this is something, again, I wanted to build on a little bit. Um, yeah. What would you suggest to get someone started writing poetry? Um, well, you know, ordinarily, I think uh, doing, you know, meeting to do po workshops is, a, is good. That's a way to get started. Um, but uh, since we can't do that, uh, there are online workshops. There are some really good online workshops, in fact. Um, so I think, you know, that that's what to do. Look and see what's being offered. And uh, it doesn't even need to be near you anymore. Right. That has been one of the pandemic positives is that you don't have to be in a physical location to protect right. things anymore. That's right. There's been a lot um, written recently um, in my field, social science, about um, trying to make meaning of the pandemic. And this is something you and I talked a little bit about uh, prior to the session today. So the, there are recommendations that people, now that we're starting to come out of the pandemic, take the time to record in some way, whether it's a, a, an artistic form or just a bullet journal, um, what life was really like during the pandemic. Is that something that you would recommend that people do? I think it's, it's very therapeutic. I really do. Um, I so suspect that, yeah. If a non-artistic person wants to kind of document in some way what this year was like, how would yeah. you recommend that they get started with that? Well, I think, you know, the journal writing is a good way to go. You know, just write down what you're thinking and feeling. And then if you are a person who has any artistic abilities, the painting or, you know, drawing or, you know, I found finger painting very helpful when I was feeling strongly about something because of just the tactile, you know, uh, the tactile work. Um, clay sculpting also has that, can give you that feeling of like, okay, this, and you know, and you're gonna mold it and feel it and then, you know, maybe roll it back in a ball and start over again. <laughs> There is something to the tactile piece. Absolutely. That, that's a little bit different in terms of creative expression. Yeah, but don't censor yourself. I mean, I think that part of what happens when we're, when we're in so much trouble like we have been is this, you know, the past year is to, uh, so that we censor ourselves. We don't want to be whining. We don't want to be, you know, but we might, we might need to do that. We might need to go back to baby talk. So don't be afraid of the baby talk and the wah wah because that will open up your throat and let you do something more, you know, more sophisticated. Very true. Um, so someone asked, how do you know when a poem is good or terrible? <laughs> you show it to my husband. <laughs> His mother never taught him about like little white lies. <laughs> and that's well, all these years that haven't either. <laughs> Um, I'll show him something and, uh, and he'll go like, yeah, no, it's not done yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you can count on that for the. Totally. <laughs> totally. But uh, let's go back to the question. How was the question framed again? How do you know when a poem is terrible or good? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, give it time. You know, you're going to take your time with it. You got a first draft. First draft is probably going to be not so hot. Um, maybe you'll get lucky. I mean, and sometimes that does happen, but you go back to it, you go back to it, you go back to it, take your time and read it out loud. You know, how does it sound? You can even tape yourself and listen back to it or, you know, uh, so that that way you have a sense of how it sounds. Can you find a better word for this? I bet you can. Can you find a better verb? That's a place where, where usually we, sometimes we can fall down on the job. So Reading out loud the poem can really help you understand its worth. What? That 
brings to mind another question that I wanted to ask you, which is, what do you think is the difference in reading and hearing poetry? Mm -hmm. So I feel like me hearing you read your poems, I have a different experience than if I just read them on the page. So how do you feel about them? I think poetry was, was born in the oral tradition. It's meant to be heard. So, um, you know, let's, let's practice reading so that we do reach each other. Um, I, over the years of uh, directing the creative writing program at UT, we had in some well-known poets who were not good readers. Um, and my husband, he's, he's the impatient one. He's, he's, um, he's a scientist, right? He, he will, um, he would say, he would turn to me and go like, I just want to grab that book out of his hand and show him how it should be read. <laughs> you know, you don't want anyone to have that experience with you, right? You want to, you want to be able to read it so that it hits home. No muttering. No, uh, none of that. You know, kick, bring your voice full now. I had a tutor years ago. One of my students was, a, uh, she is still an actress, a director, uh, and a playwright, and she was so good at performing her own work. I asked her if she would tutor me. So we went to a loft in downtown Knoxville. We went up there and we went through the poems and she would show me, no, you have to breathe, like go breathe for 20 minutes before you read. Cause otherwise the voice comes from the neck up and you know, you want to embody your poems. So she showed me and I was waving my hands like this. She said, what are you doing Evita? Stop it, put your hands down. <laughs> I was rousing the populace. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not so much. Okay. <laughs> that sounds similar uh, in some ways. My daughter's a singer. So to hearkening ah, back of course. To with songwriting we were talking about. But there, you know, it's easier because of the structure of um, song is, you know, so I know a lot of people who just write the songs and they're yes. terrible singers and they can never perform them. And so they have to sell them to someone else. Poetry doesn't really have that same kind of way, right? So it's hard to be a poet, I think, if you can't do the, the public performance piece of it sometimes. Right, but you'd be surprised. Well, yeah. How, <laughs> how many, yeah, you don't want that, no. And no chanting. They're poets who chant. Um, ah, no. right. It's like, no! Don't do that. <laughs> I've been struck by this recently. I've seen a lot of ads for people selling uh, Amanda Gorman's book of yes. the poem that uh -huh. she read at Joe uh -huh. Biden's inauguration. And every yeah. time I see the ad, I think like, would I feel the same way if I just read it? Or I, maybe I should just go back and watch the YouTube of her doing it out loud. Um, I think it's just really different um, doing a flat reading of it, but. Yeah, yeah, Didn't, she did a lovely job, but yes. but uh, the, you know, as I mentioned that Joy Harjo's our current US Poet Laureate, they didn't invite her to the ceremony. Interesting. That, she was the first Native American Poet, poet Laureate and they didn't, and, and she's a performer. They didn't invite her. I know. I'm sorry. So Amanda Gorman was lovely and I, I loved every bit of, you know, every moment and I'm glad for her success. But come on, ask Joy Harjo over to do something too, right? I mean, right. come on. Be a little more inclusive. I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, another person posted, um, can you tell us more about France? So you were oh. invited everyone else on football. Um, we yeah. were talking about France. So tell us about how you got involved yeah. with that. Years ago, I, I, I used to go to the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. It's in Sweetbriar, outside of Sweetbriar, Virginia, to write poetry. It's a, it's a great place to write. It's really, there's nothing that's not poetry there. So I, I would go there and they, uh, you know, they started, they had uh, some property in, in, in Southwest France. And I asked if they would like a, a workshop there. And they said, yeah, let's try it. You know, that was 2009. 2009. So I went, I went in 2007 to, to, to write there at their property in Ovilar. And it was so lovely that I, I really wanted to do a workshop. And I suggested that we do a workshop. We called it Oh, Taste and See, Writing the Senses in Deep France. And uh, did 11 years worth of workshop and then writing residencies there um, and I'm, I'm doing one again for them in 2022 so it's a writing residency which means that we have a small group of people everybody gets their own studio that's overlooking the Garonne River it's gorgeous 
and um, and then we'll meet, you know, f as much as people want to meet to to talk about the work. But it's not like a regular sort of hammering away away at it. There's more freedom involved. And who are the students who come to the workshop? Um, mostly they are uh, at, you know adults, all ages. Um, some now and then there's a college uh, graduate student or a college student, but mostly it's it's older people. And do you do the positive feedback like the workshop you were telling me you went to in California or? Uh, yes, um, yes, absolutely. Because if people are writing on the spot, you're gonna, you wanna encourage rather than look, oh, you know, that syllable isn't working, right? Um, and then if people wanna come see me, they sign up for individual conferences and then we do the like, nitty gritty. Well, you know, what do you really wanna know about this? And here's what I think, yeah. When I was still teaching, one of the things that I found students had the hardest time with was the idea of drafts, which you mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah. Um, so they, they seem to want to just think in their heads and then write it and then they're done. And so how as a teacher do you encourage people to do drafts? Um, and do you find that that's challenging for some people more than others? And then how do you teach them when it's done? So you could, you could do the word tweaking that you were talking about, like finding a better verb or something forever. So how do you help people figure out when they need another draft and when they're done? Well, in the workshops at UT, we would do endless drafts. I mean, that was just part of who we were. We called, I mean, that doing the drafts was part of the creative process. Um, and so keeping that door open was an essential part of making the work, uh, you know, become song. Um, and usually we, people didn't argue about it. I mean, what we, you know, we make the suggestions in a kind enough way that if the author disagrees, they just don't do it. They don't have to change it. Uh, and of course, when you're dealing with adults, many of whom have been writing before, and you want to make suggestions, they are the authority. So I can make the suggestions and if they decide not to change things, that's, that's fine, you know? I was reading some this week um, about, in preparation for today, about differences between Jewish poets in the diaspora and Jewish poets in Israel. Um, and the article was really focusing on content and so that Israeli uh, poets really tend to write about very different kinds of things than Jewish poets in the diaspora. So without going too much into the nitty gritty of that argument, to what extent do you feel like the context that we're living in shapes the way that you express? So that, well, the first, that yeah, the first thing you mentioned, well, I mean, one of my favorite poets of all times is Yehuda Amikai, who's an Israeli poet, and his poem, his love poems are totally dynamite. I mean, even in translation, they are absolutely delicious. So I fell in love with Yehuda Amikai. I think we have some things in common with the Israeli poets. We have, unfortunately, one of the most tragic things in common, you know. And uh, Jewish writers are criticized for making, for going back, oh, back and back and back to the Holocaust. But that's another thing that I, I think about, which is that we should not criticize ourselves for that. That trauma is with us. And if that's that's part of our story, that's part of our relative story, part of our kinfolk story, we should not be ashamed of going there and writing about that. Uh, it's not the only thing we write about. The Jewish humor is really a gift. And that, you know, that's a whole other thing. But the place that we live in, that's a very important part of who we are as artists. You know, that place may shift. Uh, and that you know, we, we're sensitive to the outside world and that we'll see what it has to tell us and what we need to hear and what the friction is there between where we were and where we are now, you know, that sort of thing. So yes, it's, it's hugely important uh, environment. Another thing that I was reading is what makes a Jewish poet. And so mm -hmm. the article that I was reading was kind of debating about this and I'd never really thought about it. 
Um, and so I think for a lot of people, what makes a Jewish poet is a Jewish person writing a poem. But this article was making an argument that it should be much broader than that. And it should encompass Jewish topics and, and, and various other things. So what do you think about that? Not just with Jewish, but what makes a feminist poet or, you know, a Southern poet or what? Is it just the identity of the writer or would you have a broader definition of what? I think the identity of the writer is key. Um, you know, how I feel about, uh, I mean, I, I feel about my Jewish identity the same as I feel about being a woman. It's just, it's part of me. It's just part of me. Now I want to investigate it. I want to see what that means, what it means in the culture that we live in, what it means as I move around or don't move around in the culture. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it's definitely part of, the, the identity of the writer. And then we can look at various Jewish poets and we see how much differences there are there that we can't just categorize it as like one thing. Uh, tremendous differences. But we all have some things in common and that is uh, the, the tragic history and the, the source that we come from that is the, the Torah, the Jewish writings, uh, and we have the humor. Thank God we have the humor. I keep coming back to that because we need it. Right. We also, we have some very bad wine, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> Come on, I grew up with Manischewitz, okay? It's barely wine. <laughs> okay, so we agree on so many things. Right. <laughs> so you mentioned humor a few times in terms yes. of the importance of that. Are there topics that you feel like you can't be humorous about? Well, I certainly, you, you can't be humorous about the Holocaust. That's not, that's not going to be a laugh. So no, you're not going there. Not at all. But, but otherwise, you know, and even uh, I think anti-Semitism in general, and I do tend to write about that, um, there's plenty of it going on still. Uh, you know, that's, that's, no, that's no day at the beach. We're not going to get funny about that. One of the things in my field of psychology that we've learned recently is that um, people who are able to laugh in stressful times actually have better outcomes. That's good. Um, so, and of course there, are, you know, you don't go to your girlfriend's funeral, your grandmother's funeral and laugh, um, but you, you have to know when to laugh, but um, there's really something to this idea um, that you, it helps you take things a little less seriously. And one, it's one of the areas in, in coping research where we find that there are actually big gender differences and that men are much with a lot of coping strategies, there are fewer differences than you would think, but the humor piece, men are actually much more likely to do that as a coping strategy than women are, which I, also, I always find kind of fascinating. So I'm glad to hear you as a female poet writing about the oh, importance yeah. of humor. And, oh and yeah. Well, I had a student um, who was um, arguably, he was memorably, uh, memorably bad writer. Um, he uh, put his cousin Marvin in every poem and that's hard to do without, I mean, he wasn't trying to be humorous. So lately, bless his heart, he was, in, he was a sheriff and I'm sure he was a very good sheriff, but um, he would put his cousin Marvin in every poem. So when I feel like laughing, I will do a rhymed poem and put cousin Marvin in it. <laughs> like a moose and a goose together had juice, but my cousin Marvin had a loose tooth. And, drank Manischewitz. <laughs> oh, yeah. And did you ever put bless your heart in a poem? I don't think so. Do you think I should? <laughs> I don't know. It seemed kind of begging for it as a phrase, but <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> only if you capture the true Southern meaning. Of right, right. Heart, it's like, you know, right? not the, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a compliment. Right. He was, he was a good sheriff, bless his heart, <laughs> but poets, not so much. <laughs> How has COVID impacted the way that you have written? So are you writing more or less or differently or same? During the, um, the start of it, I heard Yo-Yo Ma on PBS. He was playing Songs of Comfort. And he said, I would encourage all of you to do Songs of com Comfort in your, in your own way. That day I started writing comfort songs and I did one every day for like 60 days. So the cha a chapter of my next book is called Comfort Songs in a Time of Peril. 
and that will be, um, you know, that, that has some of those poems in there. Yeah. No, I think that, that helped me considerably. I mean, it's an outlet. It calms you down because you may not be able to, to do anything in the world that, that calms the situation. But at your desk, in front of you, with your thoughts and your feelings, you can organize them and you can create a little sense of order. And yeah. maybe a song. <laughs> right? Do you have any of those that you'd be willing to share with us? I'm looking here to see what I have. I have one here. And while she's looking, if anyone yeah. has any uh, questions as we're starting to wrap up, please put them in the chat and I will um, ask them. <laughs> so many poems, so little time, right? Yes. <laughs> Here's one. Spiritual. What power has love during a pandemic? Ours was always virtual. Plato called it. Kind love swells stronger, like a muscle that has been working out, but lighter. Invisible like atomic weights, love that lifts us daily without hope of gain. We practiced for this. Virtual, virtuous, faute de mieux. Write to me, buddy. Plato, Plato, mixed metaphors. Honey, words are all we have and hold. It's amazing. So that will come out in a new book that you're publishing soon? Yes. Uh, well, the new book is called Even When We Sleep, and it comes from Paul Eluard's line, Even When We Sleep, We Watch Over One Another. Mm. He wrote it. It was French. Même quand nous dormons, nous nous veillons l'un sur l'autre. Even when we sleep, we watch over one another. So that's the title, Even When We Sleep. Wonderful. And when will it come out? <laughs> Good. I don't know. I'm going to put you on to my publisher, okay? It's <laughs> into Leslie. It can be like that sometimes. Who wants to know when? <laughs> of course. Soon, and I will certainly let you know. Thank you for asking. Perfect. Yeah. Thank Do you. you write poems in French as well? Sounds like you speak French fluently. I translate French poetry. I don't, I've tried to write in French, but uh, the subtleties, you know, that of being just born into that language, that uh, that's, that's probably my daughter. <laughs> Hello, no. Um, the subtlety of being born into the language, it doesn't work to write in French. I've tried it, but I do translate. I translated Paul Eluard's Last Love Poems and uh, Benjamin Perret's The Big Game, um, Chantal Bazzini's uh, Disenchanted City. She's a contemporary poet. So I've done those. And that's, uh, that, that, that has also changed my life because I, it's taken me, to, taken me to France and you know, sort of immersed me in the language. Is it hard doing translations? I feel like it would be a lot of pressure to capture the kind of feeling of the original. It's a lost cause really, but um, you know, all you can do is get the feeling of it, get the sort of some of the musicality to, you know, and I couldn't, uh, Eluard's daughter was helpful to me back in the day when I started doing that. That was like in the late seventies. Um, and uh, Chantal Bazzini, is, is, she and I worked together on the translation. So I would send it to her. She'd say, no, no, you don't want this. You want something a little, you know. So that way, at least I got closer to, to being accurate. If not, you know, French, the language is sort of like a stringed instrument. And English is like Yankee Doodle Dandley. It's a hop, skip, and a jump. It's a whole different world. So we get as close as we can. Any final questions from others on the call? I feel like I've kind of dominated things today. But... You've done well. <laughs> All right. Who are some um, poets that you would recommend, Jewish poets, for people who don't or who aren't familiar with Jewish poetry? Well, Marge Piercy is lovely, and she, her work is, is very accessible, and she is um, steeped in the Jewish tradition and the religion, and so I would I would strongly recommend her. Philip Levine writes about working class, wrote about working class Ju Judaism, uh, daily life. So Philip Levine, Marge Piercy, and who else? And Yehuda Amikai, who's still writing. Bless his heart. <laughs> Bless his yeah. heart. Yeah. Noam, do you have any favorite Israel? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Do you have any mm. favorite Israeli poets <laughs> that you would want us to look into? I can send a list, okay. um, but my mom learned literature 
in university. So we have so many um, books, so books of poetry. One of my favorite is, uh, he's a singer as well, he's pretty modern. His name is Shlomo Alzi, and he has a newspaper uh, column and he writes about what happened and I really like his style. How do you spell his last name? Um, I'll see um, Hebrew or English? Yeah, English. Okay. <laughs> um, A-R-Z-I-E, okay. I think. Great, good, thank you. That's beautiful, good. Yeah, we got there. <laughs> All right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Marilyn, for being with us and sharing some of your beautiful poetry with thank us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, really. It's a, it, it, it's a, it, it helps to have community. Yes. Thank definitely. you. And thank you again to Deborah, who I know will be watching this later for connecting us together. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> All right, um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, next week, we're gonna have a representative from Turk, the Tennessee um, Immigrant and Refugee Coalition, um, talking with us about recent immigration issues and, and the situation at the border and how that's impacting us locally in Nashville and in Tennessee. Um, we Next week, Noam is actually going to be uh, the host for an event on Wednesday evening, April 28th with um, Tal Heinrich. Did I get her yeah. name right? Yes. yes. Um, perfectly. Israeli journalists. Um, Noam, do you want to say anything more about that? or? Um, I would love to. Thank you. Um, so she is an excellent journalist um, and she's going to talk about um, the vaccines in Israel, um, Biden's policy in the Middle East, and the third elections in two years. And just to run, uh, run through the Israel topics. And uh, if you have any questions, um, I'm here. I can send my email. Perfect. And then on May the 4th, Tuesday evening, May the 4th, we are hosting an evening with Barry Weiss focusing on anti-Semitism. Um, we have four different congregations uh, from around the country who will be participating with us. And then Shaul Kellner is going to be representing CRC as the moderator of that event. And so it should be an interesting evening as well. So please join us for all of that. And thank you again, everyone, and um, to Dr. Collette for uh, being with us today. So thank you.